Okay, so thank you. So we have time for a very quick question. Someone has a question. Online. So then, so let's thanks to the, the speaker again and let's move to the next talk. So the second talk is on, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. One, two, three. So next talk is racing bike. We have an improved uh, way to multiply and divide the polynomials. Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so as introduced, I'm going to talk about an improved polynomial multiplication and inversion for hardware. And this was a joint work with Mingxing Sheng, Santosh Ghosh, and Tim Gunesu. And as you probably all know, um, there has been extensive research and advanced progress in quantum computing over the last year. And therefore the NIST announced in 2017, uh, PQC standardization uh, process. And at the beginning, they received uh, 69 submissions. And um, after the third round, only seven finalists and eight alterna alternate candidates survived. And one of the alternate uh, candidates was Spike, or it's Spike. And uh, it's just recently proceeded to the first round, which means that there still is a chance that Byte gets standardized. So uh, bike is short for bit flipping key encapsulation. And since it's a uh, key encapsulation, we have three algorithm, a key generation, encapsulation, and decapsulation. And in the key generation, we, um, com or we sample a private key consisting of two polynomials, H0 and H1, and the random string sigma. And we compute a public key H, where the public key H is computed by H1 computed by H0 by the inverse of H0. Then, um, ah, then um, in the encapsulation, we uh, sample two, um, two error polynomials, E0 and E1 here in line two. And based on a secret message M, which is again, a random string consisting of 256 bits, and then we compute the cryptogram. And the first part of the cryptogram C0 is computed by E0 plus the product of E1 and the public key H. And then the second part of the cryptogram is the message X XOR with a hash of the error vectors. And then we can compute our shared secret key K based on the secret message and the cryptogram. And then in the decapsulation, uh, we use the um, private keys H0 and H1. And first of all, we compute a syndrome, which is a product of the first part of the cryptogram, C0 multiplied by H0. And this syndrome is used in the decoder with the private key, so H0 and H1, try, uh, which tries to recover the error polynomials. Um, and then the error polynomials are again, again hashed and XOR to the cryptogram C1 uh, in order to um, recover the secret message M. And after we verify that the um, secret message M and error polynomial matches, we can recompute the shared secret key. And for our work, these three lines are the most important one because in each um, algorithm, we are using a multiplication, a polynomial multiplication. And in each of these multiplication, we have at least one sparse polynomial. So in the key generation, H1 is a sparse polynomial. In the encapsulation, E1 is a sparse polynomial. And in the decapsulation, uh, H0 is a sparse polynomial. And we utilized, um, well, we tried to utilize the sparseness and implement a specific sparse multiplier. And here, let's assume we perform a multiplication H, which is equal to, uh, or which is F times G. And in this time, F is a sparse polynomial such that the Hemming weight is equal to T 
and t has to be much much smaller than r where r is the um, size of the polynomials in bike and then we can represent our sparse polynomial by indices which represents the non-zero bit positions of f and our multiplication can be performed by shifting um, the yeah the general polynomial g uh, multiplying the polynomial g by x to the power of i where i um, are the um, indices representing the sparse polynomial f so at the end the multiplication just accumulates t rotated g which are rotated by the um, indices of the sparse polynomial okay and this is the um, hardware core uh, the hardware core which we implemented and you can see it consists of basic elements so we just have a few registers in place we have a few multiplexers and add-on and subtractor um, some rotation unit here and at the end the accumulation stage and uh, when we perform a multiplication hardware we always start to read in uh, one index of the sparse polynomial and then we start to read in um, chunks of our um, dense polynomial or of our arbitrary polynomial and since our polynomials consist of at least uh, 12,000 bits we have to split them up into chunks and um, all these chunks are b bit or have, um, have a size of b bits and then um, we always store two of these chunks um, in these uh, first two registers here and then we perform a rotation a bit word rotation on them and the number of bits we, which we have to uh, rotate the um, two chunks is um, defined by the lower bits of the sparse index and after that we um, receive or we just extract b of these um, bits then and can accumulate them to the current intermediate result and write them back to the memory and the upper part here is the rotation unit which is um, which performs the rotation on the word level and it's basically just a counter um, but and the counter is initialized with the upper bits of the sparse index of uh, with the indices of the sparse polynomial and then we have um, access to two memories and we decided to use two memories because then we are able to read the current intermediate result and write back the new intermediate result in the same clock cycle okay so by using this model we uh, module we can easily perform the multiplication for the key generation and decapsulation but there's a problem for the encapsulation since we computing c0 is equal to e0 plus e1 times h and in bike um, the weight of e1 is not uh, defined so only the weight of e0 plus the weight of um, e1 is fixed and therefore if we ju just would use um, the module which i just presented the multiplication would not be constant time um, and therefore we um, did some modifications to the core but more details can be found in the paper but in the end we managed to implement a constant time multiplier which always finished uh, finished in r divided by b plus four times the hemming weight of the sparse polynomial clock cycle and what you can see is by scaling the parameter b so, so the internal us bandwidth you can um, you can control or you can um, you control the speed or you can control the trade-off between area and latency and uh, first we instantiated our multiplier for a hemming weight of so uh, hemming weight of 71 for the sparse polynomial and b equal to 34 um, for the first security level of bike and compared it to an implementation from 2019 and you can see we um, we consume slightly more slices but we are definitely faster than the multiplication from 2019 so we can perform one multiplication 180 mic mic uh, microseconds compared to 661 microseconds and therefore our area time product is definitely better than the implementation from 2019 and then uh, we compared our sparse multiplier um, to an implementation of to the first bike hardware implementation from last year and now we instantiated the multiplier for hemming weight of 134 so this is the multiplier which is used in the encapsulation for b equal to 128 so um, and what you can see is uh, now so compared to the multiplication used in the first hardware bike implementation which um, was 
basically a school book multiplication. We consume definitely less um, hardware resources, but our latency is quite a little bit worse, but at the end, our area time product is um, better. Okay, so this brings me to the second part of my talk, um, the optimization of the polynomial inversion, which is used in the key generation. And in the first hardware implementation of bike, we implemented the inversion based on Fermat's little theorem. And now we investigate in another approach based on the extended Euclidean algorithm. And using the extended GCD, we instantiated with x to the power of r minus one and h zero, which is a polynomial which we would like to in invert. So and this is always one in bike. So the GCD is always one, which is then equal to u times x to the power of r minus one minus v times h zero. And in this case, v has to be the inverted polynomial h zero. But the problem is the traditional extended GCD is not constant time because it depends on secret inputs. Um, but this uh, problem was solved in 2019 by Bernstein and Young. So they um, proposed a constant time extended Euclidean algorithm, which uses this diff step function, um, which um, uses the degree difference of the two polynomials f and g, and then performs this nice operations here, which is not that important what it does, but what is important is, for bike, we have to initiate it with delta, the DD difference, which, which is one, and then with the two polynomials, x to the power of r minus one and h zero. And then we have to perform two times r minus one of these diff steps to, um, yeah, to get our um, inverted polynomial h zero at the end. And what we can do to optimize this diff step function is first, we can, um, we can, yeah, let's say we can express this diff step function by two functions. First, the conditional uh, swap where we replace delta f and g with minus delta g and f in case our um, degree difference is larger than zero and g of zero is, e uh, is unequal to zero. And this is always followed, followed by an elimination step where we replace delta f and g with one plus delta f and this nice expression here, which can um, gladly be optimized in bike because we are in the Galois field of two. We can perform two optimizations. And the first optimization is that we only have to compute two control bits. And the first control bit indicates if the degree difference is greater or uh, greater than zero. And the other control bit is uh, G um, of zero. And the second simplification is that F um, of zero is always one in the case of bike. So this will simplify this equation here. And at the end for our um, implementation, we split up this um, diff step into two functions. The first function is get control bits and the second function is update FG or uh, VW. And um, one of this diff step um, course then looks like this. So we have two course updating the polynomials. So F and G are initiated with X to the power of R minus one and h zero. And we and w are initi uh, initiated with one and zero. And the, de the degree difference is um, one at the beginning. And we can compute our control bits just on g and delta. And then we have a lot of diff steps. Um, and here we introduced another parameter s, which is the step size. And then we can perform s of this diff steps in one iteration. And this allows us to perform two times r minus one divided by s of these um, um, iterations to perform the entire inversion at the end. So we have two par um, parameter to control our latency and our area. So the first one is a step size s, and the second one again is a bandwidth parameter b, which was also used for the multiplication. And uh, here you can see some results for um, b equal to 32, and then a sweep over the step size s. Um, the step size s can be, max, can be at maximum uh, b, so in this case 32. And we can see by increasing the step size s, we can reduce our latency, but the hardware utilization is increased linearly. And um, the nice thing is that we can really control our implementation adapt and adapt it to the given environment. So for example, we can instantiate a very lightweight design 
So setting S equal to uh, one. And then for the case B equal to 32, we can perform one um, inversion by just spending roughly below 200 slices. But of course, our multiplication will take around 100 milliseconds then. But on the other um, hand, we can instantiate a very high speed design and setting S equal to B. And then in the case setting B equal to 128, okay, we have to spend a 21, over 21,000 slices, but we can um, compute the entire inversion in 500, milli, uh, in 500 microseconds. And then we um, compared our um, new approach. So the approach based on the extended GCD to the approach based on Fermat's little theorem. Um, and we instantiated our new core such that it um, roughly takes the same amount of clock cycles as the design based on Fermat's little theorem. And you can see we, um, we are using less hardware resources, so less slices than the approach based on Fermat's little theorem. So at the end, it's more efficient than the old approach. So um, in the paper are um, some more contributions. So for the first time, we validated does a, um, that a single catcher core is more efficient than uh, in hardware than a SHA-2 and an AES. And based on that observation, uh, observation we um, changed the bike specifications. And now bike is um, also defined um, by uh, um, and the bike specification. Catcher is now uh, specified right, to you. Uh, to use um, bike with SketchUp is now specified. And then um, we also presented a unified um, bike core, which um, contains all three operations. So the key generation, encapsulation, and decapsulation. And the core can be controlled over a nice interface here. And all our very log files are publicly available on GitHub. Um, yeah, so in summary, we presented a new polynomial multiplier. We investigated how we can use a polynomial inversion based on um, the extended GCD, and we present a united hardware implementation um, of the entire bike algorithm. So, yeah, thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Had a question for Jan. Yeah, that's cool. So because you are um, running out of yeah. time, so I'll suggest to move to the next talk. So next one, uh, thank you. Sorry, can I quickly ask one question? Oh, sorry. Hmm? Sorry, can I can I ask one question very quickly? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I did not see oh, you. Sure. Yeah. So just one very quick question. How did you implement uh, the rotation unit for very large sizes of B? Um, just in combinational uh, logic. And um, yeah, so it's just combinational logic between two registers then, and we can just extract the desired bits, uh, which are used then for the addition unit. So, okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, So next, next tool will be on a complete um, and improved FPG implementation of classic MacLeaks. Uh, talk will be given by Bo Yan Chen, and I'll let him present his co-authors. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Chen Boren, and here I want to present complete and improved FPJ implementation of class matrix. While doing this work, me and Wen are still students, but now I have graduated with a master's degree and Wen has received her PhD degree. So let's get started. In this presentation, I will not go through the details of how we implementation, but give an overview presentation and introduce some crucial component for a FPJ implementation adherent to a round three specification. Our work is constant time and provide compile time parameters in terms of security and performance. 
So classically scan consists of three parts, key generation, encapsulation, and decapsulation. The main building block as follows. The CD key gen consists of shade 256 key gen F26 miser. The encapsulation consists of shake 256 fixed weight and encode. The encapsulation consists of shake, decode, and filtering. In this work, by using some core function from the reference from WSN 16 and 18, we designed and implement the other Howey module for all three primitives. The reason we remarked CD keygen here is to differentiate our contribution from previous work because they do not implement a pseudo random number generator PRNG inside the key generator module. As you can see, Shake 256 is a shared module. It's used for uh, hashing, PRNG, and C generation. In the CD keygen, I will introduce our earlier board systemizer and the secret key compression. Especially the F2 systemizer is the main contribution in this work because it reduced the average cycle count of public key generation significantly. In the encapsulation, I will introduce how we design a fixed way module with PRNG inside and how we implement a sequential encode module for joint design. In the decapsulation, I will mention how we design a re encrypt module. Besides, uh, some steps in the CD key gen and encapsulation might fail. Thus, we generate the next C value in parallel without computation, so the time overhead can become zero. So let's move on to our contribution in the public generation, the F2 systemizer. The central computation in the public generation is to compute a systematic form of a binary matrix, where we call a Howey module, the F2 systemizer. Because the matrix size is hundreds of kilobytes or one megabytes, the invention process is very time consuming. Especially the systemization might fail whenever, whenever an input matrix cannot be reduced into a system manifold. If that happens, we have to generate another matrix and apply the invention again. On average, class requires require 3.4 attempts to successfully compute the public key. However, it's not necessary to compute the complete raw actual matrix if that Cannot, it's not, it cannot be systemizable. We can abort the computation earlier if there is no pivot row found on the left diagonal of the matrix. In this work, we present three algorithmic systemizer variants that pre-process left square part of the matrix to detect if the matrix is systemizable or not. They are hybrid early level systemizer, HEA, single pass early level systemizer, SPEA, and dual pass early level, DPEA. Uh, all of our designs outperform prior art by about two times in average runtime and time area efficiency. I'll introduce them step by step later. The Gojong element design usually use an uh, array of computation node organizing this timeline or this time network. This approach is fine for relatively small metrics, but for large metrics like classic crypto systems, it was, this will require too many resources. Therefore, previous work proposed to decompose the matrix into several column block and apply the emanation column by column. Especially the design from WSN16 not only adopts a similar approach to eliminate matrix, but also has the advantage that the size of the process array can be chosen freely. This feature is also introduced in our systemizer design. Generally, the systemizer will string the data from top of the P array and back out the data from the buttons. During pivoting computation, you will pass the operation to the rightmost column and store them in a dedicated memory. During computation, apart from pivoting, the stored operation will be imported to the leftmost column and applied on processors within the P array. So to systemize the matrix, there are two common approach, single pass approach and two dual pass approach. A dual pass, a uh, hard example is the design from SWN 18 and 10. They perform the, the compute reduced raw actual matrix in two passes. So in the per first place, it performs the forward elimination and get a upper triangle of matrix. At this time, it can check if all the diagonal of that square part matrix are all one. If they are all one, they can perform the back substitution and get a systematic form of the matrix. So instead of separating the process into two, two paths, 
The design from WSN16 performs forward and backward elimination in one single pass. At the end of each pivoting step, it continue pivoting the data from upper triangular, uh, triangular matrix so that each column block will be fully reduced. The computation in single pass uh, approach is very regular because in each phase, all column block and rows of the, uh, all rows of the matrix are processed sequentially. All in all, the single pass approach can be implemented in hardware with simpler logic. And efficient, it is more uh, efficient for one single systemization. However, it takes more time to uh, examine if the matrix is systemizable or not. That is to say, if the matrix are not guaranteed to be systemizable and the overhead of generating another matrix is significant, the dual pass approach might be more efficient. To find out which method is the optimized one, we have to consider which earlier growth strategy is adopted, overhead of generating matrix. And also we have to consider the dimension of the input size and the choice of uh, the column block size. In this design, uh, our, our three earlier growth systemizers feature different elimination strategy with scalable process array size. By carefully analyzing HEA, SPA, DPA, we can get an optimized one based on the application scenario. So let's introduce our first early growth systemizer, hybrid early growth systemizer. As the name impl implies, it combines two approach in this design. Here we present a toy example of how HEA systemizer work uh, with the matrix decomposing to several column block. It is a 9, 12, 12 matrix and the quantum block size S is three. At first, we only generate the left square part matrix and apply the forward elimination on matrix. If all of the diagonal elements are all ones, we will generate the entire matrix with the same seed and then perform, apply the elimination with single pass skin. The HEA systemizers has the advantage that it is fast for check error and uh, it requires less logic usage. However, it has to, sorry, it has to regenerate and re-eliminate the left square part of the matrix. Secondly, we want to introduce the single pass early board systemizers. To avoid operation wasted like HEA systemizer, SCPEA systemizers stores and reuse the operations from the first check. So at first, it generates and systemizes the left square part of the matrix. Specifically, the operations are stored back to the original pivoting column, while the operation for implementation is maintained with additional list of memory. The reason SPA can store the operation back to the original position is that those data have been fully reduced. On success, it will generate only write part of the matrix and replay those operations on it sequentially. To sum up, SPEA systemizers can get rid of redundant operations uh, with little memory usage. However, it takes more time to check error due to uh, single pass scheme. This finalist one introduce the dual pass early board systemizer. To reduce the cost of checking, DPA systemizers performed forward elimination on less square part of the matrix first, and then replay operation and perform backward substitution in the end. So at first, it will perform the forward elimination on the matrix, just like the HEA systemizers. But the difference is that it stores the operations back to the original people in column block. On success, you will perform replay those stored operations on right part of the matrix. At this stage, we, can, uh, we will get the upper triangle form of the entire matrix. So by carrying out back substitution, we can get a systematic form of the matrix. The DPA systemizers has the advantage that it is fast for check error. However, the pivoting rows are read out twice in the second stage and the third stage, which diminishing DPA's efficiency when computing with large column block size. So in this presentation, we don't only give an algorithmic description of our systemizer. You can refer to the paper for more hardware details, like we, how we design the processors, how we manage operations, and how we 
reduce time and memory demand by overlapping steps. And at the end of our systemization, uh, we also give a detailed comparison for our work and previous work in MACLIS 34A864 using Arctic 7 FPGA. In addition, we provide a cycle count comparison for our three systemizers in large parameter sets. So let's move on introducing other improvement in key generation, circuit key compression. So as specified in the specification, the default secret key format is Delta CG Alpha S, where Alpha is stored as control bit in the best network. Our key generation module does compute S and Alpha as shown in step three and step four, where our module does not use the control bits and hence does not generate them to save time and area. Therefore, our decapsulation module, decapsulation module simply take the Delta CG as input and try to restore the S and alpha by using key generation module. In this way, we can buy large memory space with computation. This uh, alternative approach is explicitly mentioned in the specification as a choice to compress the secret key. So uh, let's want to talk about the encapsulation fixed way. A fixed weight module is to use to generate a uniform random unbeat error vector whose hemming weight is exact T. In the first step of uh, uh, Arcosan, it has to generate a sigma one tau ran uniform random unbeat, where we use the shake 256 as PRNG for C generation. But in this work, we generate extra 512 bits for next seed value. This is because the process might fail whenever there are fewer than T entries from a range from zero to a minus one. If that happens, we'll use the 512 bits that we pre-generate to generate another sigma one tau plus 512 bits. We know this uh, specific way of random bit generation is the implementation choice we made and it's not a part of specification. So next we'll talk about how we design the sequential encode module. In classic MACLIS, the encode module simply take the error vector and the public T as input and try to generate the ciphertext with matrix multiplication. So the design from WSN18, they have different storage format of public key from key generation module and encode module. That is to say, to have a joint design, they have to transform the raw matter public key into color module format in encode module. This will take lots of efforts. Besides WSN18, they do the multiplication with the four-way size. Although this implementation performs well in terms of frequency and cycle, but it will require too many resources in a key generation module because of a large process array with the four-way size. In our design, we present a sequential module which have the same storage format as how the public key is generated which is raw material format. Although we have to spend more time computing the multiplication from entry to entry in a sequential order, we can instead share the large memory space of public key in key generation and encoding for joint design. So we are now in the last part of our presentation, the encapsulation of classmate, please. After the error vector is recovered, there are two more steps to check the validity of recovered error vector. The first one is if the Hamming weight of E is T. The second one is if HV equals HE. The first validity check is straightforward. We just scan through the error vector and extract the Hamming weight. But here we also pack the index of the non zero bits to a vector called error bit index. As spe specified in the section 2.2.4, we can use the double size parity chain matrix H2 to compare H2V with H2E. Because H2V is a sub-module in a decode module, we can simply reuse the module to compute H2E with the error bit index as input. Because the input module simply encode a fixed T index of every vector, we can, uh, the process must be constant time. The table here shows a uh, uh, time and area result for our joint class MACLIS into flavor, lightweight, and high speed. And we compare our design to other existing hardware, a core-based cryptography, bike and HQC, 
at security, NIST security level one using Arctic 7 MPGN. Overall, our design require a relatively high cost for lightweight variants, but shows a good performance for high speed variants. Especially the high cost of key generation can be compensated using optimized systemizers if sufficient resources are available. So in the end, we have a uh, revised on typo and add some context to uh, elaborate parameter S in section 5.2. And our source code is released in this link. Uh, uh, please note that the code of systemizers described in this paper will not provide currently because it closely related to my master and NTU and NTU hope to protect the code offline or even with pattern but we will still provide a specification, a specification compliant implementation to this thing. So in the end, I want to thank all the support from the chairs to have me attend chess in person and thanks for listening. Questions or comments? So thank you. Yeah, thank you. So the last talk in this session will be on a large integer extended GCD algorithm and hardware design for verifiable uh, delay functions and modular inversion. And talk will be given, I think. Um, oh, sorry, it's not that one. Sorry, so um, the next call will be on a part of the time decoder for uh, in this sector and application device M. Okay. And sorry, talk will be given uh, by uh, Thales Peva. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello, everyone. I'm Thales and I represent uh, the paper. So, uh, Okay, so uh, where should I point this? Sorry. Oh, thank you. Okay, so our main motivation is bike, which is a post quantum code based scam. Uh, it was recently selected by NIST for the fourth round, and it consists of a variant of the need reader scheme using quasi cyclic moderate density parity check codes. Um, the 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 coder used by bike is called BGF, which is uh, which is a a very efficient decoder that is designed specifically for bike, uh, which com and also comes with uh, a better analysis of the decryption failure rate, which is the DFR. Um, it's important. This analysis is important because the DFR should be negligible if you want to apply CCA conversions for uh, to bike, and for it to be secure. Uh, our main contrib contributions uh, is that we show some limitations and potential problems with BGF. And we also propose a, deco a new decoder to solve these problems. So this decoder uh, lowers the number of iterations needed to decode uh, uh, ciphertext for bike. And we could achieve uh, a, speed up, a, speed up, uh, a speed up of 1.47 for 256 bits of security. So differently from the other talks here, uh, our main contribution, well, there is uh, some implementation contribution, but uh, the, main, the main contribution is a new decoder. It's a, it's a more theoretical contribution. Uh, so let's recall bike in its simplified uh, one-way uh, secure version. So for the key generation, we have uh, two matrices, H0 and H1, that are randomly selected. Uh, they, are, they should be binary circling matrices and they should be sparse. This is the main characteristic of, of this matrix. And the, sec the secret key is H, which is composed by these blocks, H0 and H1, which is a sparse matrix. And the public key is H pub, which is simply a square circling matrix uh, composed by 
or, or computed by taking H1 and multiplying it by H0 inverse, and it's dense. Uh, for the encapsulation, you first generate two random vector, two random sparse vectors of R bits, A0 and, H, and E1, and the, the sum of their weights should be T, which is one of the parameters of the, QC, of the bike scheme. Uh, and then you simply return C equals to E0 plus E1 times each pub transpose. Uh, for the decapsulation, you compute Z equals to, to C times H0 transpose. This is the secret syndrome. And if you evaluate this, you get that Z is equal to E0 times H0 transpose, E0 times H0 transpose plus E1 times H1 transpose. And therefore, Z is the syndrome of, uh, with respect to the MDPC, MDPC code generated by H, and you can use an MDPC decoder to obtain E0 and E1. Uh, so why can we decode Z, or why can we obtain E0 and E1 from, from Z? Uh, the argument is that H is a sparse matrix and E is a sparse vector. Therefore, Z tends to be similar to the columns of H that are selected by E by the non-zero non non entries of E. Uh, this similarity index is called UPC, and it simply, uh, the UPCI is simply equal to the scalar product between, between the ith column of H and Z transpose. That is the, the number of uh, entries that, in which they are equal. So uh, the, the decoding process is an iterative process of learning E based on UPC values. Uh, the main characteristic, characteristics of the BGF, which is the state-of-the-art bike decoder, is that it uses or it requires five iterations for all security levels. And the first iteration is an expensive iteration, but it's very careful to make few mistakes. And it uses uh, a linear function for, um, on the, the weight of the, the secret syndrome to define a UPC threshold that decides which, which bits to flip. So remember that high, UPC, uh, high UPCI implies that there is a high probability that EI is equal to, to one. Uh, so to, to achieve negligible uh, decryption failure rate is, is a very difficult task in, in bike because the, the real, you, you have the quasi-cyclic matrices, which implies, a, a, which is difficult to analyze because of the relation between the, the, the rows. So this is done, usually using uh, what, is, what is called the DFR extrapolation framework, uh, which is due to Nicolas Andrien and Valentin Vasser. And it consists in the following steps. First, you fix all bike parameters except the block size, and you make the following assumptions. You assume that the log of the de decryption failure rate with respect to R is a concave function in the interval where the DFR is, is uh, greater than or equal to, to your negligible target uh, failure rate. And you then use simulations to find at least two DFR points, and you can extrapolate to find the block size R0 that achieves this negligible failure rate. So here in the figure you can see here in, in the, the black line is the true uh, DFR. And uh, we find two points with, the, with simulations and we extrapolate a line, and we can find a, the value of R0 achieving the desired negligible failure rate. So, uh, this work, for this work, the main question is how can we make a BGF more efficient? So it uses five iterations and the natural, a natural question is, can we make it use less iterations? Uh, so we get to this problem. When, you sim when we simulate BGF using a lower number of iterations, we get uh, that for two and three iterations, the, the DFR curve is clearly not, not concave. So we cannot use this number of iterations. Uh, but it also raises the questions, well, if it's not concave for two and three iterations, why should ex we expect that, it, uh, that it's concave for four and five iterations? Uh, so uh, unfortunately, unfortunately uh, simulations cannot find concavity problems for four and five iterations because they, they may occur, the, the inflection point may occur in a, in a DFR too low for us to, to, to see with, with simulations. So we use uh, uh, a robustness test against uh, BGF, which consists of, of applying it to exaggerated error rates uh, greater than the, the, the value of T that is proposed by bike. Uh, 
when, when we do this, this simulation, we can see that even with five simulations, BGF uh, is, uh, doesn't appear to be concave. So it's clearly not concave for, for these values of T, but it's difficult to, to, sit, to, uh, to answer if, uh, if this implies that BGF is not, is not concave for T equals to, to 134. But it's difficult to ignore this evidence. And uh, what happens to BGF is that it, it uh, I, I believe that it has a threshold problem that uh, since it uses uh, for the threshold of, for calculating the UPC value, the threshold UPC for fli flipping bits, it uses this function here. It is the max of 36 uh, and eight, A plus B times the, the weight of this, the secret syndrome. So the problem here is that the weight of the secret syndrome, uh, it grows with R. So when you, when you let uh, the, the block size R uh, gets larger, uh, the threshold gets really, really larger, and it's, it stops being effective at, at flipping, flipping the right bits. Uh, so our solution to this is use a new, uh, new decoder called the picky, picky fix, which uses two procedures. The first one is fix flip, which flips a fixed number of, uh, of bits with the larger two PCs. So it doesn't use a threshold to, to flip bits. Or, or at least it doesn't use a, a, a fixed threshold. The threshold here depends on the on uh, all the UPC values. It's not simply a function of the uh, of the syndrome weight. So a good values of n flips, which is the number of bits to flip, is computed by simulations. And this iteration is used in the in this procedure is used in the first iteration to avoid the threshold problem. And the second procedure is picky flip, which uses two thresholds for flipping bits. One to flip ones to, to zeros and another to flip zero to one. And it's picky with respect to the syndrome of the resulting uh, error, because the threshold for, uh, for accepting a one is greater than the, the threshold for accepting a zero. So using this very simple, uh, these two very simple uh, uh, procedures, we can get the decoder that ap uh, appears to be concave in the, in the interval that we want. But uh, please notice that since we want the negligible failure rate, we, we cannot plot this, we cannot uh, see this with simulation. So this is done by using an exaggerated error, uh, error weight. And even with uh, uh, this error rate, the decryption failure rate obtained by picky fix is, is much lower than the one uh, uh, obtained with BGF. So uh, the implementation of, of picky fix is, um, uh, there, there's one part that is easy and the other is hard because picky flip is easy to implement using bikes code because the only difference is the threshold selection. But fix flips constant time implementation is not trivial. So we have to, in the paper, we describe an efficient procedure to select the highest UPCs. Because this, uh, to do this, we do a, a sequence of uh, counting sorts um, and, some, uh, and some other, uh, and there are some other ideas on how to randomize the, the selection of which bits to flip. Uh, the problem with pixel flip iteration or procedure is that it is 30% slower than picky flip. So we cannot use only fix flip iterations. Uh, so here is the speed ups we, we obtain using the, the, peak, the picky fix uh, algorithm. And for, for here we show selected results for the three security levels provided by bike. And we can see that for two iterations, for example, we obtain between 1.21 1, speed up and 1.45 speed up. And the implementation is vector is efficiently vectorizable, so we, we can also keep uh, uh, keep a nice speed up in the AVX five twelve implementation. Also, uh, you can see that there is some trade off between the number of iterations and the 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 block size, which is also the public key size. But we believe that uh, it's uh, it, it can be can be an interesting trade trade off, and this trade off it's important to notice is not provided by BGF because it cannot work with a lower number of iterations. So uh, this uh, this work raises some some 
interesting questions, I think. So the first one is, can we use fixed flip for efficient decoding without fixed thresholds? So uh, BGF, BGF's threshold function is a simple uh, linear function on the, on the syndrome weight. So can we use, the, uh, can um, we use this, uh, our, our design of fixed flip iteration to design more complex thresholds, like thresholds that are based on the, the set of UPC values, not on, uh, on, not only on the syndrome weight, which is related to the UPC values, but not directly. So this is a this is an interesting open question, and how to strengthen the concavity ascension is a more theoretical question, which is I think very important to 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 better to understand. So, for example, um, yeah, the not all the coders are are uh, have concave curves. So how can we how can we um, we we see the coders to to allow only the ones that are really concave. So does the the exaggerated uh, experiment with the t values uh, work to to see these decoders? And it, the other question on the the other line of work is: Is it possible to patch BGF? Because one could say that uh, you can simply apply a, a a maximum value to the to the the threshold selected by BGF, but this is not ideal. Because if you do that, you get uh, a number of problems. Like uh, the main problem is that you get a non-uniform decoder with respect to R. So it's difficult to apply the, the, the DFR extrapolation procedure for these, type of, these types of decoders. Um, so our source code is available at my webpage and on GitHub. Uh, so thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you, Thales. Uh, other questions? Yep. Um, did you investigate the effect on the key generation? Because I mean, you increase the uh, polynomial size R, and this will definitely have an effect on the speed of the key generation. Yes, no, no, I, I understand your question. Yes, um, there is an impact. Yeah. But no, I didn't, I didn't investigate. Yes, okay. Thank you for your question. And uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, I, I'd, I'd like to point some uh, an important uh, thing is that uh, when you when uh, when you see this picture here, this table, it, it makes us compare. Like uh, you can see that there is a, about a, um, between five percent and ten and ten percent increase uh, from the parameters for for the original parameters by bike that you that you showed in your slides, but uh, I, I'd like to go beyond that and and, and say that uh, BGF probably uh, th there is a problem a potential problem with, with BGF right so it it may be difficult to to it make it may make the these numbers uncomparable but uh, it's difficult to to to, to see so any other question yeah no so thank you and thanks to all the speakers of this session. Okay. So it's no time for a well-deserved coffee and next session will start at 10.50. <laughs>